prayer of invocation. Unfathomable source of life, generous giver of life, outflowing spirit of God, we come to worship as those who have found the spring of water and return to satisfy their thirst again. Refresh our spirits by your spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Fellow believers, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But as we confess our sins and repent of them, God hears us and offers us mercy and pardon. So let us confess now as a family of believers, and then in silence bring our personal confession before the Lord. Please be seated. Let us pray. God of all nations, forgive our biases and prejudices, our refusal to have dealings with those of other races and orientations of which we do not approve. Excuse our religious one-optionship that seeks to exalt our own persuasion at the expense of others, and that would rather debate non-essentials than find common ground and concerted action. We are convinced that we are right and have stubborn in resisting any evidence that we should change our minds, soften such hardness of heart with the moral of the Spirit. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. We have been put right with God through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our first scripture lesson this morning is from Exodus chapter 17. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people. Take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, for I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the ancient story of God's people. Open our hearts to God's word. <coughs> Our gospel lessons from John chapter 4. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus... Tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, 
Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you say that the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Then his, just then his disciples came, and they were astonished that he was speaking with the woman. But no one said, What do you want, and why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see the man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard it ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the good news. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ.
pleasing to you and reflect your will in our lives. Way back, 1999, it seems so long ago, I guess it is a while ago, I was down in Arizona and Mexico on a mission trip with seminary. We had to go for a couple of weeks and experience another culture and experience uh, the life and times of different people. So a small group of us from Lancaster Seminary chose to go with a larger group from Chicago and other places to this border retreat that was down in Arizona. So we were stationed, our home base was in Tucson, and then we would drive down and spend the week for several days in Mexico and then come back and forth. So one morning in Tucson, it was very hot. As I learned, every day would be hot down there. Wasn't quite ready for that, but it was very hot, very dry. So we were taught from the moment we got there by the leaders of our tour that we had to drink a lot of water. Carry a water bottle with you at all times. So we had our water bottles, canteens, whatever it was, you had to have one with you for close by, wherever you went. Well, one morning we got up, it was 104 degrees at 8.30 a.m. I thought, wow, it's not gonna get any cooler today. But we were headed for Mexico a little later in the afternoon, so we had to get ourselves ready to go. So my friend John and I decided this would be a great morning to go do the laundry. Because we were only in the U.S. for another couple of hours, and then we'd be gone for days at a time. So we loaded up our laundry in our big bags, and we carried them down the street to the laundromat. And my other friend, Jerry, stayed back at the house, and he was writing letters back home. And our friend Brent, he, we called him the crazy one, because he decided to go jogging. Because that's the kind of thing he liked to do. He was, you know, one of these guys was always in shape and everything. And so he said, I'm going to run a few miles before we go get on that bus and spend time riding on a bus and everything. So he went jogging. Doing anything in that heat was tiring. Everything we did just seemed to take the energy right out of you. But you would, you would sweat the things, but you wouldn't really notice like you do here because you didn't feel like you were wet. Because the moment you'd sweat, it just dried right off of you. So you didn't feel like you were losing that much liquid, but you really were. So I noticed that in a short time, you could feel a little more thirsty. But we were all, you know, drinking, drinking lots of water and pop and juice, whatever we had around. And it didn't seem like it was that big a deal. We northerners were not used to the level of heat that we had there. John and I did our laundry, we carried our wet clothes back, and then behind the house we were staying in was a big chain link fence around the backyard and their little parking spot. So we threw our clothes over the fence because we were told before we even left, don't spend any money on a dryer. You won't need it. So we carried our wet clothes back, we threw it over the fence, and by the time we were ready to leave a little, you know, a couple hours, it was completely dry. The jeans were like really stiff when they got them off the fence. It was so hot and dry, it just sucked the moisture right out of it, right out of the stuff, which was really nice and saved us a little bit of money. But we were just you know, getting chores done, getting ready to go. We had to pack things up, get ready to get on the bus and go back to Mexico. And, and our friend Brent came back from his run, had breakfast, seemed like he was happy, he was excited, he got his run in, he ran his miles, whatever he was supposed to do. And pretty soon we're on the bus, we went down to the golf bus. Part of the things that we did when we went there was we toured the slums of Nogales, which were all right along the border. People that were living near the border, working in factories, some waiting to cross into the U.S. And we were there for hours, visiting different families, going to different missions and things like that. And about three in the afternoon, Brent said he felt really strange. He said, I got a terrible headache, I'm feeling nauseous, and he just, he didn't look good either. He just looked really bad. And we were all in our early 30s at that point. So he just didn't look good. So our, our, our guide, who was part of the, the organization that led us there, instantly recognized that he was dehydrated, that he had gotten himself to a point where he didn't have enough fluid. So he needed to sit down. He needed to drink some water. He needed some Gatorade and all that kind of stuff. To get back 
and be refreshed. And we were all warned to do the same thing. And we thought, oh, we better do it. We simply overlooked our body's need for water. Because water doesn't stay with us very long. It passes through us, it cools us, it keeps our cells moist and functional. What amazes me is how easy it is to forget to drink enough to keep us healthy. If we can ignore our body that easily, we can certainly overlook the needs of our spirits as well. And our spirits need refreshment every moment. When Israel was in the desert, the people made camp in one area and soon realized that there was no water to be found, no easy source of water. The people were traveling from Egypt to the Promised Land, and they were wandering around in the desert, and when they looked for places to camp, they looked for places that were flat and easily uh, defendable, places they could build there, set up their tents, and stay for a while. They didn't just camp one night and then move on. They camped for maybe days, even weeks at a time. So they set up their camp and then realized that they didn't have enough water. So they started to complain. And if you can imagine how people are right now, there are people out west that built a town, uh, a housing development, out beyond the city limits, and they didn't have enough water. But they didn't pay taxes to the local town, so the town shut off their water supply because they're having a drought. And these people no longer have running water in their homes. You may have seen this on the news. So they're living with those big giant tanks and things like that. They have to pay to have water trucked in from other places. I don't know if they're still doing it today, but as of a week ago, they were still doing that. So it, it can be easily happen that you could wind up in a place where there's not enough water. The people turned on Moses, complaining to him, Moses, you're trying to kill us. And this is typical, if you remember your lessons from Exodus, the people would complain, they didn't have food, they didn't have water. It's too sunny, it's too cloudy, whatever it was, they, they complained about everything. And they were complaining to Moses. And Moses was like, what are you telling me for? I didn't pick the spot, or maybe he and the elders did pick the spot. I don't know. But anyway, the people were complaining. And God was called upon by Moses to provide water. Moses prays and says, these people are ready to kill me. i got to do something. Can you give us some water, please? God tells Moses to take some of the elders with him and go to this big rock at Horeb on the, the holy mountain. Carry your staff with you, the one that Moses struck the Nile with, if you remember that early part of Exodus. Strike the rock at Horeb, and when you do, water will gush out of it. Now that is a miracle. I don't know if you've been, been hiking or camping or anything else. You don't just go around hitting rocks and water comes out. It doesn't work that way. But it did for Moses. People again were now refreshed. They had plenty of water to drink, and presumably they were in much better spirits than that. And it wouldn't be until the next problem came along that they would complain again to Moses. Why did God do that? Well, God, of course, loved these people, and He wanted them to be safe. He wanted them to reach the promised land. Even though they were complaining and whining and not very grateful, He didn't want them to perish. So He provided for them. Israel continued to test the patience of God, and God continued to be merciful, which is a great lesson in itself. We continue to test God and complain about our existence. We lack faith in spiritual water. We blame God for our deficiencies and our weaknesses. Fortunately for humanity, God offers us something different. He offers us living water, water for our spirits, water that never runs out, water that flows into us, God's presence. Jesus offers us that water to fill our souls, and it doesn't run out. To make this liquid even more refreshing, Jesus gives it to anyone who asks of it. Anyone who wants it. Right behind me here, I have a plain old water bottle with some water in it. Imagine if I held one of these up and said to each of you, I'll give you one of these, and it will never run out. It will always be full, no matter how much and how often you drink from it. It will never run empty. It will always be perfectly cool or warm, whatever temperature you like, that's what it'll be. It'll be perfect, and it's eternal. It'll last the rest of your life and far beyond. Would anybody be interested in that? Probably, right? Certainly, maybe not today, but in the summer we would really be interested in it. And that's what Jesus was offering. Not physical water, but a refreshing power in the Spirit. And 
there. The gospel lesson of Jesus was traveling through Samaria. And if you remember from your other lessons, the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. And there was a long historical reason for that. The area of Samaria was Jewish territory before the Assyrians conquered them in 722 BC. So this goes back a long, long way. So remember, this is 722 years before the birth of Jesus. These events began to happen. So by the time you get to Jesus, this feud between these people had been going on for over seven centuries. That's a long time to hold a grudge. The Assyrians and other races that they conquered intermarried with the Jews of the area. And those generations that followed were not considered pure Jews by Jewish definition. So these people, the Samaritans as they became known as, were rejected by the Jews, pushed out from the faith because they, had, they were not pure in blood. Now we look at that, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us because we don't think that way, or at least most of us don't think that way. But back then, that was very common. And tensions continued between these two tiny little nations, and these areas are very small. It's hard to tell when you look at a map, especially a map on a screen like that, but these are very tiny areas. If we got in a car, we could drive across all of Israel just a little, very short time, just a couple of hours. We could drive from north to south in just a, maybe twice as long that way. But still, it wouldn't be as long as driving across Pennsylvania. So we're talking people that were in close proximity to one another. So you think after 700 years, they'd get to learn to live together a little bit better than they do. But human nature, I suppose, interferes with that. These people didn't get along that well. And then finally, when the Jews decided to fight against Syria and defeat and defeated the Syrians, the Jews, the Jews drove back their enemies well past Samaria. And when they did that, they destroyed the Samaritan capital of Shechem. And the hatred between those two people was then set in stone. Because the Jews, they conquered the land and they, they didn't quite take over completely, but they smashed everything in their path. They destroyed the cities and villages and that left long-standing hatred between them. With that kind of bad blood, it's no wonder that the Jews and the Samaritans chose to separate themselves. So when Jesus had to pass through Samaria, which in order to travel around, these people would have to cross through each other's territory. You know, otherwise, they'd have to go out way out around. But when Jesus was crossing through Samaria, it was unusual that he would choose to stop and rest. And even stranger, that he would dare speak to a Samaritan, in particular, as a rabbi, to speak to a Samaritan woman. So that makes the whole story even more unusual, in that Jesus does something that would be completely unexpected of a Jewish rabbi to do at that time. And it was about noon of the day, Jesus was sitting in the shade of the well, and this woman comes to fill her water jug. Now this, of course, is the first century, and people would fill these water jugs in a well or something, take it back, and that's, that was your household water. There are many, many people, millions, maybe billions, that live that way still today. We don't think about that too much around here. We turn on the tap and got water. But she would have to get water, fill a jug, take it home, use it for whatever they needed it for, and then if it ran out, she'd have to be back to the well to get more. So here she was at the water, at the well, getting water, and Jesus says to her, Give me something to drink. And she looks at him because this was unheard of. Not only would they not to not to, to speak to each other, but to ask a favor of one another, to ask for hospitality. That was a strange thing. No righteous Jew would take water or food from a Samaritan because it would make them ritually unclean. That means they would not be considered in favor with God, in favor of their own religion. But the woman became suspicious because of this. And she thought, what does this Jew want from me? And Jesus answered her and said, if you knew who I am, you would ask God to give you living water. And he goes to explain, everyone who drinks from this well will need water again. But I can give you water that will last forever. The woman sees great value in that, in such a refreshment. So she says, yeah, sure, give me that water. I'm tired of coming to this well three times a day or however many times. She needed to do it. Give me this living water. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> Jesus said to her, 
Go and get your husband, bring him back. You guys can share. Go get your family, bring him back. And she says to him, I have no husband. And Jesus said, yeah, that's true. You, you've had five husbands, and now you're with somebody else, and he's not your husband. He didn't say that with anger. That wasn't a statement of judgment. He wasn't making some accusation against her. He was just stating a fact about her life, something that would be very unusual, because back then, having five husbands and being close to number six, that was very, very unusual. Even, you know, I mean, today's a little different, but even six is still a lot today. But Jesus says this to her, so she knows. He has to be talking about me. It couldn't be somebody else. There wouldn't have been anywhere near enough people that had that situation that he could have just guessed and got that right. He knew because Jesus was getting this information straight from the Father. He didn't say this, again, without judgment. It wasn't something he was accusing her of. He gave her this story, he mentioned this to her, so that she would understand that he was from God. She took him to be a prophet. She said, you must be a prophet to know this about me. Then she asked him a question. Where is God? Where do I go to worship him? My people say it's on this holy mountain. Your people say we have to go to Jerusalem to worship God. And Jesus said, you don't need to go anywhere to worship God. Time is here. The day is now when everyone will know where to find God because the Messiah will come. He was telling her, you're not going to have to go anywhere to worship God. God is all around us in spirit and truth. And he repeats that a couple of times. He told her the big secret. I am the Messiah. I'm the one you're waiting for. She was elated. She believed it. He had said to her, he had said amazing things to her. She understood that he was telling her the truth. So she was elated, and she left her water jug behind to go and tell her neighbors the good news. Now that in itself is amazing. He, she left her water jug sitting there. That would have been a very important thing to do, to leave it just there by the well and go. That was a good way to lose a water jug, to just leave it sit by the well and abandon it. But she does that because her, she's overwhelmed with joy. She's overwhelmed with this new knowledge that she has received. She goes back, she tells the people in town what this guy said to her, and they come to believe. They get excited because they recognize the truth of what she's saying. They were all thirsty for living water. They wanted to drink their fill. And when they heard from Jesus himself, they asked him to stay with them, and he remained in their town for a total of three days, give or take a little. And as the text says, many more believed because of his work. He gave them what they needed filled their spirits with that living water. Imagine that for a moment. The most outcast people of the day, the lowest of the low on the totem pole in the Jewish culture, were given the good news and the living water straight from God's fountain, the Messiah himself. The Samaritans were unworthy by the religious standards of the day, but Jesus reaches out to them and offers them a clean start in God's mercy. It's the same gift that he offers each to each one of us. We have this lesson during Lent every, every so many years to remind us that we are all remade in a new way, that we're all worthy of God, that we're not separated from God, we're not separated by blood, we're not separated by where we came from or what language we speak, all of that kind of stuff. None of that matters. All of us were loved and appreciated by God. And we're all offered this living water as a refreshment to our souls. If God does this to quench the thirst of this five-time divorcee, ask him yourself, what can he do for me? What can he do for all of us when we simply ask? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask now that you continue to pour out this living water over us, beginning with the water of baptism and continuing through our lives as you refresh us with your spirit. We ask now that you strengthen us for the days to come, that we may indeed endure this moment and this time of penance as we come before you and ask to be made clean. We ask again that you continue to be generous with this gift of living water. We ask all of this in the name of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as 
as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I would thank you for your tithes and offerings, remind you the plates are in the front and back, and thank everybody watching us on Facebook for providing uh, their tithes and offerings, and ask everyone who is watching us to please mail in your offerings, and if you're not a member of this church or the church down in Irwin, please keep in mind all of the local churches in your area and all of the charities that are in great need at this time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the abundance and bounty of gifts that you offer to us, and we return to you the first fruits of our labor, along with our time and discipleship, as we live to serve you and to share the gospel message. We ask, Lord, that you accept all of our gifts and help us fight to use them properly as we fulfill our mission in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, I invite all who are able to please rise for a closing hymn of the one time we meet.
May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Go in peace. Amen. Hey, yeah. Don't fall.